is excited to welcome a successful architect, founder and principal of Partners by Design, and founder of Auto Program Incorporated, a software firm. While doing all of this, he also is an explorer, a pilot, and an inventor. Today he's going to talk to you about his travels to the Arctic Circle, to find the doomed English naval mission where two ships and over 100 sailors disappeared. Please help me welcome Mr. Ron Carlson. Thank you. Boy, I hope I can, uh, I hope I can live up to all that. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I want to thank Ms. Hanrahan, Mrs. Hanrahan, Mrs. Pope, and uh, Mr. Chopra, and, and Ms. Ippolito, and, uh, and Mr. Gardner, too, for letting me do this uh, today. But uh, wow, is this all the eighth graders? Basically, the eighth grade class. Um, so anyway, who wants to hear about history? Anybody want to be history? Yeah. OK, OK. All right, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to get back, but I'll tell you, when I was your age, I grew up in Niles, Illinois, uh, little Ron Carlson, and uh, I didn't really pay attention to history. I was in the class drawing cartoons and daydreaming, and uh, you know, I'd go home and think about playing that Pong game. I know that's before Xbox, but uh, history is, uh, you know, we're going to talk about uh, history, but then a lot of adventure, and I think, I think I've, I've, as I got older, I started looking at history as adventure, and uh, you know, George Washington, Lewis and Clark. I mean, they're really, these people lived, uh, most, most of the history is you listen to history in class and as you grow up, it's, it's really adventure stories. I mean, that's all it really is. Um, famous events, but each of these people, they lived, they lived fascinating lives. It was just uh, fascinating to, and that's what really got me into this. Um, so what we're gonna do is to give you a little overview. Uh, we're gonna talk about some, a little bit of history and then we're gonna get to kind of some of the fun stuff. Um, some of my expedition work to the Arctic. And it really all started with a book. And basically, 15 years ago, you know, I started really getting into history. I picked up a book by this guy, Chauncey Lewis, called Weird and Tragic Shores. It was kind of a funny name, but I was really into this Arctic stuff. Guys, you know, going to the Arctic in the 1800s and disappearing and dar starving and dying and polar bears. And uh, so I picked up this book. And it was about actually a guy named uh, Charles Francis Hall. Um, uh, but Charles Francis Hall was born in 1821. And he was an American guy. He was a, you know, uh, an American explorer. And he was actually searching for these guys that I'm going to talk about today, these guys from England that disappeared up in the Arctic. And what's fascinating about this book and about this guy is he, he did it different. He went up to the Arctic. And he lived with the Eskimos. I mean, you can't, most of the people that went up there in those days, they would, they would live through the summer. And then when the winter came with, uh, you know, the English and the way they, you know, the gloves they wore and the, the type of clothing, they couldn't survive it. Because 60 below in the winter, 60, even 80 below zero. And there's no sun. Um, you know, when you get into December and January, February, it's polar darkness 24 hours a day. So he went up and he, he was actually searching for these guys um, in the 1860s and even into the 70s, and he would live with the Inuits. And what this is all about is what's called the Northwest Passage. I don't know if any of you have heard of what that is. Um, but back in the day, I mean, going back into the year 1000, everyone was trying to find the way to get to China from Europe, and it was, it was a, a fabled shortcut. There's a, there was a bas basically a two-year voyage to get, uh, in some cases three years, to get to uh, the, the Far East from Europe. So uh, the Holy Grail was trying to find this, this Northwest Passage. No one could do it. And that's actually what Franklin, the Franklin Expedition, they were trying to find this Northwest Passage. So basically, um, the king of the seas, if you will, in the 18, even the 1700s was England. And the English were, you know, conquering continents, Australia and, and other places, and they were, if you will, the king of the seas, the admiralty. And they said, well, we need, we're going to be the ones to find the Northwest Passage. So the, the admiralty got together. They put out a plan. They got two ships, their best ships. Actually, one of the ships is very famous. If you know the Star Spangled Banner, that part that says stars bursting in air, bombs bursting in air, that was written by Francis Scott Key. 
that, that ship in the background, the HMS Terror, was one of those ships. So 100 years later, they re-outfitted that ship for this Arctic expedition, along with the uh, ship called the Erebus. And they put together this crack team of men, uh, Sir John Franklin leading the expedition. Um, Sir John Franklin was a really famous guy. Uh, he fought with Admiral Nelson the Battle of Trafalgar, which is a famous uh, a, a ship uh, battle that happened uh, between Spain and France, and, and uh, he was a real famous guy, but he was getting a little over the hill. He was kind of more the, um, the figurehead leader and, and kind of the brains, um, the father. But the real leaders of the expedition were these two guys, Francis Crozier and James Fitzjames, and they each took uh, each, they were, they were the, the captains of each of the ships, um, and the flagship was the Erebus. Now what's cool about these pictures that I'm showing you are these are the actual pictures of the men on the dock the day before they sailed. And it was when photography was first invented, it called it daguerreotype camera, daguerreotype. You know, those pictures, those giant boxes, you know, uh, it was the first camera invented. But what's, what's amazing is you can, you can see in their faces, you can see these are the actual men that disappeared up there. And I started getting fascinated when I started looking at these pictures of these men. And in fact, I really got into it. If you look at the, the, the bill of their hat, the shiny bills, and some of the images, you can actually see reflections of the ship that's in the dock. And in one of the pictures, you can actually see Sir John Franklin standing there. But anyway, here's, here's, uh, here's some, some images of some of the men. And again, here's the voyage, Northwest Passage. Leave England, come up around Greenland, many have tried, entered up near Devon Island and basically sail into the ice pack. And what you need to do, what they need to do in all expeditions is get there in the earliest part of the summer when the ice is just breaking, because you only have about two months to try and get through before winter sets in again. That would be in June, July, August, late August, starts going downhill. I was up there and I could, we'll, t we'll talk about some of that. And what they would do, this was a three-year voyage, they would take the ships up there and they would basically sail as fast as they can get as far as they can in the two months, and then find a safe harbor from the ice pack, because the ice pack will crush a ship in a matter of days, if not hours, and just freeze in, and live in the ship like rats for like eight months. Polar darkness, um, really brutal. So they did that the first year, the second year, and three years later, there's no word. You know, the, the longest the expedition would be would be three years. Uh, but they expected to be through the first year, maybe the second, but now three, four, four years later, no word back. So they started sending search expeditions out. Where, what happened to the Franklin men? Now it's six years later, seven years later. Now they know they're in trouble. The first clues that were found, what happened to these guys, was several years later, uh, as you enter from the ocean by Greenland into this Lancaster Strait, uh, this little place called Beachy Island, and it was, there was a little bay there that the ships would winter at. It's a protected area, and it's, the island's called Beachy Island. And when they, when they sailed into the harbor of Beachy Island, they saw on the shore three graves. And these were the first clues, and they found some artifacts. These, these are pictures, actually, from today of the canned goods that they brought with them on their expedition. Canned goods in 1845 was new technology, except they made a mistake. They soldered the cans with lead. So these guys were getting lead poison the whole way, along with their other challenges. They found that, and they found three graves. The other two graves, by the way, that you see on the ends are of searchers years later who, who died there searching for them, who were also buried next to these three guys. John Torrington, um, Hartnell and William Brain were the first three guys to die. And what's kind of spooky is that this is what it looks like today. And by the way, there's no trees up there. This is near the magnetic North Pole. In the height of summer, it's about 50 degrees. The wind's blowing like 60 miles an hour. And that's, a, you know, that's one day out of maybe 20 days where you get sun. That's more typical. And I'm going to show you a quick clip of an expedition team that went up there in the 80s, and they dug up one of these guys. Why had these three men died so soon on the voyage? Compared to previous Arctic expeditions, this was already an extremely high fatality rate.
In the headstrong world of the 1980s, a group of Canadian academics went to Beachy Island. Forensic science was taking up the Franklin Challenge. The scientists had got permission to exhume the three bodies. They were going to dig into the permafrost and poke into the past. But just like the 19th century investigators before them, the scientists were destined to find only fragments of evidence. Curly, dark. When the expedition leader, Owen Beatty, revealed William Brain's face, it was as though the Marine were being brought back to life. So, frozen in time. Boy, I saw this stuff. I was like, oh man, I gotta go up there. I gotta find some bodies. <laughs> this was really cool stuff. Um, that's John Torrington. Uh, they did an autopsy on him. I mean, these guys, this, you're basically going in a time machine to 1846, and these guys are completely preserved in their sailor outfits, the striped shirts, their whole, their whole outfit, uh, just like it was yesterday. So as you piece the clues together, um, and, and some of the historians and explorers that have been up there before me, they've determined that these guys were up there at Beachy Island. They stayed the winter, and as soon as the ice broke free, they sailed south as fast as they could. But unfortunately, what they didn't know was they were, they were sailing into a trap. And they were actually on the right route in the Northwest Passage to find their way out, but they were sailing into a trap because all of the polar ice, they call it the multi-year ice, that's the ice that never melts, comes down, as you see up there, from, from the north, from, from the, the ice, the polar ice cap. And it, it just, it's called an ice sink, and it just gets trapped down there. And they sailed right into it. And the problem with that is, is the whole idea is you, you, know, you winter the whole year, and when summer comes, you get two, maybe a month, maybe two months to get in the boat and sail. Well, they were, there was no summer ice, ice pack break. So they were stuck there, and, and that's an actual satellite image of it. And that island right there is where they got stuck, King William Island. And basically this was probably the scene. This was probably the scene of these guys trying to pull the ships out. That didn't work. So what did they do? The only thing they could do after two years of living on the ships, they had to try and make a break for it. Get in their lifeboats, drag their lifeboats, and just just try and hike out of there. Now, the nearest place they could go was a place called Yellowknife, and there was a fort there. It was 600 miles away upriver. I mean, just an impossible task. So they started giving up the searches. You know, after 10 years, no one's found Franklin. People are dying just going to look for Franklin. So Franklin's wife, Lady Jane Franklin, you know, she was passionate to find her husband, so she hired this guy, Leopold McClintock, who was a famous explorer, and the thing he did, he did a little differently. He took a little ship up there instead of a big ship. He took a smaller crew, and then he took sled dogs and, and the sleds. So they, they, they went up there, and they actually started finding some artifacts. This is a famous note that's in a museum, and that's a note that was written by uh, Fitzjames and Crozier just before they died. And what's interesting about this note, it was left in this copper canister in the stone pile they call a cairn. It's a marker, and of course you can see those things when they're when you're up there. You can see them from five miles away because it looks like the moon. Pictures of the moon up there. I mean, it's there's nothing. But in the columns, in, in you can see here at the top. It's like you know, here's where we are: latitude, longitude. Sir John Franklin commanding the ex expedition, all well. But then in the margins, a year later, they wrote some terrifying stuff. Basically, and you can even read it down there, uh, the, the, the ships are being deserted, officers, there's only 105 of us left, which means 15 or so died. Sir John Franklin's dead, here's when he died. And uh, we're gonna try and make it for the Backfish River, and that's that, that, that journey I was talking about. So again, more clues, and this is really the, the uh, uh, a most interesting find and, and kind of a spooky find, a very spooky find. They found a, a basically a boat. Now, this picture, you know, in those days they didn't have cameras, of course, so some of these guys would bring artists along and they'd actually sit there and render a picture of the scene and they dramatize it. I mean, I can tell you there's no big ice walls unless you're in the middle of the ocean. But they found a lifeboat with two bodies in it. And one of the bodies 
was still sitting in the corner with his hat on and the guns were locked and loaded. And this was about 12 years, 15 years after they, they uh, uh, and they think it's Graham Gore. So here's some actual pictures of some of the artifacts that were found um, on the land. I found some of the stuff I have found. Um, again, I didn't bring anything back. I didn't really touch anything. So my first expedition up there was in 2003. I'm a pilot. I'm a bush pilot. Um, and uh, what I always carry with me is survival gear. You know, there's all kinds of survival gear packs that you can take, but that's the first thing you got to think of. I'm a big what if guy. What if this happens? What if that happens? You know, take some managed risks. You get up there. You got to be thinking of your backup plans. You know, that's a basic survival kit. And then there's all kinds of survival kits. But I think the, the most important thing in a survival kit is this, fishing stuff, especially if you're near water. I mean, I, I wouldn't really need anything else if I had this. Uh, so if you, ever, if you ever go on a camping trip or some crazy expedition like me, bring, bring fishing stuff. Um, also have a survival suit in case you fall in the water. We all know about hypothermia. If you fall in the water, you've got a few minutes, then you're, I mean, the water up there is freezing. I mean, it's, it's almost always um, ice pack. Uh, that's not me, but uh, that's, I did, I did a little swimming in it, it works. So the first year I went up there, I brought uh, what's called side scan sonar. Side scan sonar system is like what they find underwater ships. And it kind of paints 3D images underwater. Uh, that's actually the torpedo, I call it. Um, that's dragged underwater behind the boat. And my plan was to have a Zodiac boat all in the plane, bring it out of the plane, let's go, let's search for these sunken ships. Now, by the way, I did a lot of work and research on where the ships might be, came up with my own theories. Uh, before I went up there, and here's some imaging of some sunken ships from that system. So here's my first plane, that's a, called a Cessna 206, actually very limited plane, limited space, limited weight, but it was my first time, it was kind of like stepping stones working my way up to, to doing this. That's actually a Thunder Bay Airport refueling. And then the next stop was a place called Gillum, and you, saw, you start to see the trees start disappearing, you were starting to get near the Arctic Circle, and this is where I ran into my first problem, this was in 2003, where this shot is actually about midnight, and uh, I had refueled the plane, drums of fuel, roll them up, portable pump, battery, and I left the fuel cap off, loose. Now the problem with doing that is when you're flying, the fuel cap's off, what happens? The fuel starts like evaporating out, and you don't know it. So sure enough, I'm like, my next stop is a place called Churchill, and it's probably the cool, it's the place I wanted to stay overnight or stay a couple of days because this is the highest density of polar bears in the world. This is where, the, you know, you see on the Discovery Channel all the polar bears? That's where it is, Churchill. And basically flying up the, uh, the Cape here, I'm flying up here the Nelson River, and this is Hudson Bay Ocean. So I'll, I'm going to show you some shots as I'm flying up here. And this is flying down that river. This is what it looks like. And as I'm flying along, there's just like shipwreck after shipwreck. I mean, you could, you could land there, and I explored one of them and, and found a skeleton. Here's one in low tide that, you know, this is from like 50 years ago, some are 80 years ago. They're just, they're just abandoned. You can't, you almost can't get to these locations, and they're just preserved. Um, I found some trading posts. That's Hudson's Bay Company back in the 17 and 1800s. Uh, those are some of the trading posts, all in the wilderness, all preserved. So I'm flying along here, and I've got, you know, I've, I've got uh, taken, you know, flying, and I'm just shooting pictures and having a great time. And meanwhile, I'm, look, I'm, I'm coming into where all the polar bears are, and I'm only at 100 feet. I'm flying this plane one-handed, taking pictures. I'm like, oh, wow, look at all these polar bears. And then the engine stops. Now, normally when you're at altitude, we call it, 3,000, 8,000, 10,000 feet, it's no problem. Not that it would happen, but if your engine stops, you just go into a restarting mode. It, basically, all planes are gliders, even 747. If you shut the engines off a of 747 up at altitude, it's a glider, as long as, you, as, long as you're going down, you're, you're keeping your airspeed up. Well, I was too low. I was too low to do anything except to either land here or land here, and not, you, don't want to, you don't want to be sticking your head down and, and uh, you know, what's, what's the problem here? Because when you stall an airplane, that's when it goes like this. That's when you die. 
So the key, the key is, is you just put it in a glide. I'm going to go here or I'm going to go here. There, you have about eight seconds. It's got to be like that. So you see that pond? That pond was a little bigger than this gym. I came in there about 70 miles an hour, and as I hit the bank, I ripped back on the yoke, got the nose up, and bounced into the tundra. Not a scratch on the plane, no problem, except that I'm stuck, and I'm stuck in an area where there's tons of polar bears. So I ended up on top of the plane with a satellite phone, my GPS position, radioing in, uh, search and rescue, come pick me up while there's a polar bear circling my plane, trying to get up, and that's him. I finally had a helicopter come and uh, pick me up. I had to leave the plane there for three days, which terrified me because what the polar bears do is they just love to get inside the airplane and tear the airplane apart. They like to eat the foam. In fact, snowmobiles up there, everyone knows, you, put your, you have to protect your snowmobile because they eat all the foam. They want to eat the foam. And they get, probably get sick, but they just love it. They just tear the seats off. So inside the airplane, you just tear the airplane apart. It's basically like an aluminum can. So actually, that's a uh, satellite view of actually the exact position I landed. And we came back with Parks Canada, was good enough to send a helicopter pilot, Parks Canada guy, to help me. And we ended up getting the airplane back up on its landing gear. And that's a whole story. It took about three hours. And, and it didn't sink in the tundra. And the beauty was is we had a, uh, there was a beach ridge right here, a little bit of gravel from thousands of years ago. That used to be where the ocean came in. So it was, it was firm enough. It was firm enough for me to do uh, for for me to do a takeoff. So I ended up getting a short field takeoff. The helicopter filed, uh, f uh, followed me back to Churchill. I was like, "Okay, mission back on." And um, I'm going to show you just a few shots here of Churchill's a really cool place. A lot of history there. I mean, this this is actually a picture of the fort um, that was built in the 1700s. Uh, it was built uh, to, to guard the river, and uh, there's plane crashes, plane wrecks. It's really cool. You could go, you could just go hiking and just find crazy stuff. Shipwrecks, uh, beluga whales. The wildlife up there is incredible. You've got beluga whales. You've got orca. Um, I landed in the Churchill River. This is my picture sitting on my float, and these whales were coming right at me, and I was like, oh, my God, what did I do? You know, and I'm holding on. I just watch them go under like torpedoes, like they have sonar, they know, even in the muddy waters, 15 feet deep. This is where they have their babies, the, where they, the beluga whales calve their babies, and they're, they're swimming all around me, checking my plane out. And then, of course, there's the polar bear, and that's always been a big fascination for me. Now, here's a polar bear in the zoo, right? We all go to the zoo. And, and by the way, I'll tell you, I've seen, I've had a lot of experience uh, in Alaska with brown bears, with black bears, grizzly bears, peninsula bears, which is a form of the grizzly bear. I've been Kodiak Island. I've had close, I've had one major close call with a 700 pound boar uh, while I was out by myself with a dead caribou. And uh, grizzly bears, they don't stalk you. They, he just wanted the food. I handled the situation right. I didn't get in trouble. It was very scary. When there's no bars between you and the bear, it's, a whole, it's just a different feeling. But the polar bear, they're all huge. I, I got to tell you, I was flying along counting polar bears, and they're all, they're like 800, 1,000 pounds, like the ones you see in the zoo, but not as fat. They're a little leaner. This is a polar bear in the wild. This is what you see flying up there low. You're going across the ice, you see a big blood spot. You know, they hunt meat and they stalk. They're unlike any other bear in the, the world. They're very smart and they'll smell you from miles away. And that polar bear that came up to me that was on the plane, he took, he took about an hour and a half to get to me, but he never walked towards me. He was doing this, he'd sniff around over here. And then he's like, he'd sniff around over here. And then the whole time he's coming closer. He never looked at me. That's how they stalk. So eventually he ended up, he was trying. He never really looked at me. He's like, how am I going to get this guy? Uh, this is an unfortunate guy up there while I was up there in 2003 that almost died. And this is why I don't sleep in a tent. I sleep in my plane. And I, I carry weapons. <laughs> Not even bear spray. I mean, but the best thing for bears is bear spray, and that stuff is nasty, but it'll save your life. But up there, the wind is blowing so hard, you could spray, and it's just, it's, it's, it's not, you got to have guns. Um, this is a sad story that happened on my, uh, uh, um, the expedition before last year. 
this Chapal boy was killed. They had a camp and they didn't put their, their fence, they put a little, little electric fence around. It's like a warning system. And I don't think it was working. They had guns, the guns weren't loaded. They just weren't prepared and a polar bear came in, killed the boy, mauled three others. Uh, finally, they killed the bear, um, but it was, uh, so these polar bears, and it's not like the movies. I, I always laugh because, have you ever seen the movie The Edge with uh, Anthony Hopkins and, you know, they're flying with the beaver and they're in Alaska? Anyway, the story is they end up being stalked by this big brown bear, and, it, and, and the climax of the movie is the bear's charging, and he picks up this giant spear, and as the bear jumps, he lays down, wedges it in the rocks, and the bear comes down, and he's dead instantly. Well, let me tell you, it doesn't work that way. When a bear is shot, even with a high-powered rifle, they live for like 15 minutes, and they're mad. Because to a bear, it feels like they've been hit by a two-by-four, and it's like, who did it? They don't know they've been shot. They don't even know what a gun is. So you, if, if you get in a situation close range with a bear, a polar bear, you better have some very heavy armament to, to bring them down and bring them down fast. So, of course, me being the extremist I am, I, I have, the, I have the, the top gun is about the largest rifle you can get. It's very heavy. It's called a 460 Weatherby, a 500-grain bullet that moves at 2,500 feet per second. It's for Cape Buffalo and Elephant. Don't plan to use it, don't ever want to use it, but I'm not, you know, if it comes between me and the polar bear. And then for very close range, uh, that's a Mossberg Persuader shotgun. That's the shell that I use, uh, that I was describing, and I almost had to use it. Um, I was looking for polar bears to take pictures of on my way up, and this again is, is in the ocean in Hudson Bay, and I was at a unique time when the ice was melting, but there were huge, I would call them ice flows, like islands. And I was like, this is perfect. I can go out there and look for polar bears. Sure enough, I finally found one. And the polar bear was up in that area you see there, and I parked my plane strategically away from him so I could get on the ice, get some long-range pictures. Of course, I brought my, my gun with, and I brought my binoculars. This is actually from inside the plane taxiing up after I landed to that ice flow. <laughs> And there's ring seals, they come right up to you. And, and uh, so I get out on the ice, I walk about 30 feet, and there's seals there, like you saw, and they're jumping in their holes. And I'm like, hey, this is really cool. And I got my camera, I was like, where's the polar bear? And I, he was like over there. But you can see there's like, the, uh, from the air, it looks all flat, but when you get down there, there's like, where's he hiding? You know, I got, I'm like, I gotta get out of here. I was very, my heart started beating. And sure enough, I come back to the plane. I get in the plane. I didn't even waste any time. I took off with the door open with the gun on my lap. I wanted to get out. I left the anchor there. And when I came back around where I'd parked the plane, what the polar bear did is he got in the water and he swam all the way around, swam like 1,000 thousand yards within 15 minutes. So if I would have stayed five more minutes, I would have been in a, in a fight with, you know, shooting this thing. And you don't want to kill a polar bear, by the way, because it's like a murder trial up there. Uh, it's always your fault, uh, even when you're hiking. Like here I was hiking, um, here's, here's uh, I knew I wasn't in a danger situation because when you, when you have two or three polar bears, it's usually females, um, you can see they're checking me out here. I didn't feel like I was in any danger. I had my shotgun, but the, 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 the problem, that you, the, the thing you have to be real careful is when you get up there, what you don't see is there's a polar bear, there's a polar bear right here. You don't see them because there's like an eight-foot dip. And when you're walking along, you've got you to be not tripping, but you've got to be constantly looking up. Because you could come right over a little, rit, or a little hill there, and boom, you're, you're looking at a 1,000-pound polar bear, and you're not going to be running, believe me. So these were females. They didn't want to have anything to do with me, so I got some cool pictures. And they're, they're massive bears. They're beautiful. Um, Arctic owl. Uh, just a few scenes. So, you know, if you ever, you know, in your lives as you get older and you do some, if, if any of you are outdoors people, I highly recommend going to Churchill. It's a really cool place. It's back at the airport. So now back on with the mission, heading up to a place called Baker Lake. This is what it, what it looks like. Uh, and then from Baker Lake up across the Arctic Ocean, uh, it's called Queen Maud Gulf, up to a place called Cambridge Bay. Cambridge Bay is where my base was, which was close to where uh, where these men died. Here's a few shots. You can see how barren it is. 
and that's called the Barren Lands. This is where the caribou trek, but basically uh, there's nothing up there. A few shots, I'm gonna go through these pretty quick. Uh, Cambridge Bay Airport, everything's gravel, everything's rock, water. These Arctic hares are about this big. They're like dogs, I mean, they're huge. Um, muskox, you've probably seen pictures of muskox. It's really cool wildlife up there. And then the black fly. I don't know if you ever, ever, if any of you have ever heard about the black fly. Black fly is a nasty little thing. It looks like a gnat. And when they're biting, they, they come in swarms. And um, even with insect repellent, you, you, this, is a, this is on the Seal River, and that was me. I took a picture of myself with a self-timer just before I went on a hike. And when I came back, the plane was black. It was covered in black flies. So it was like the movie, ever see the movie, The Birds? Where you're like tiptoeing and you know, I'm opening the door and all of a sudden they, they started going and man, I went the plane and they all started coming in and I got the plane fired up and I'm going down backwards the current of the river and I got black the whole, I can't see anything out the windshield because they're all inside, I've covered the, because they're trying to get out. So I got the prop going and the wind's blowing around and finally make a long story short, I get up to altitude, I got up to like 8,000 feet autopilot and I got most of them out and they're smashed and everything was gooey and I'm like, man, my legs feel really weird. And I had these hip waders on all the way up to here. I pull the hip waders down, it's just, Black, thousands of black flies got in there, biting black flies. Luckily, I had jeans on and wool socks pulled up. They were all dead. They're all suffocated. So I took my socks and I just threw them out the window and uh, landed back in Churchill. Uh, improvis imp you got to improvise while you're up there. You got to be very resourceful. You know, this was, you know, I had a, a, a big storm coming. You got, you know, how am I going to tie the plane down using drums of fuel, drilling holes in the permafrost? I brought a generator with me. Here's where I ran into almost, uh, 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 this was probably my scariest moment on any of my expeditions. This is where I almost like became a skeleton like Franklin. The idea here was to, I had to do work on King William Island, meet the Inuit, and in order to come uh, do my work down here, do some searching and make it all the way back to Cambridge Bay, I had to do what's called a fuel cache. That means the day before, two days before, I flew on this red mission here to try to get to this lake store fuel here, fly back, and then go on my mission two days later and do all this stuff down here, come back here to make it back. Because the, the, the plane can only fly for four hours full fuel. So anyway, I went down there that, to do that, and that lake, that's that lake, it looked great on a, these are uncharted lakes, but it looked great from a map, but when I got there, it was like mud. I don't know if they're boulders. I mean, a lot of these lakes are four feet deep. And if you can't see the bottom, you don't know what you're going to hit, and it's over. You hit a boulder or something. I mean, there's no logs to worry about, but it's all rock. So I was, I was like, oh, man, this mission's over. But on the way out over the ocean, I saw this beautiful little tucked away beach that was protected from these huge tidal waves. And it was on this, these island shoals about 20 feet above sea level. So I landed there, and uh, that's little G.I. Joe I left there on the island. And, and that's, you can see there, that's actually where I landed and I stored the fuel. That's in, really in the middle of the ocean, but in this little protected beach area. And I took the camera and I put it on the float and, you know, I did a little pose walking. But can anyone tell what's wrong with this picture, what's odd? There's something really odd going on. Can anyone tell? What's that? Nope, that's not it. Anybody else? The water, see the water that's coming down? Where's that water coming from? Is there a river or a lake up there? No, tides, the water's going down and it's going down fast. The tidal shifts up there and the ocean are anywhere from 12 to 15 feet. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is after I'm playing around with GI Joe and you know, I'm building a little statue before I leave of rocks, you know, I won't be like the Franklin guys. I look out at the plane, and it's like almost out of the water. So, and, and there's a storm coming the next day. I'm only 30 feet above sea level. What's going to happen? So I had to run down there, get the plane. I got it turned around, and uh, I got it, got it floating again. And then I secured the plane. And then I ran into another problem. The other problem was I went back up there, and then I got the fuel in place. 
And then I look back, and um, I hadn't secured the plane enough, and it's, it's getting sucked down in the tide. It's like, it's like basically when I was looking at it, it was like over here, getting sucked right out. So anyway, I didn't have to swim for it. I almost had to, but I made it. If that plane would have got sucked out, I would be a, there's no fresh water. All my survival gear, sat phone, everything's on that, everything's on that airplane. I'm like, I don't know how long it will last a few days. That would be a skeleton just like Franklin. And no one's going to come searching here. So, again, survival gear, the what ifs, uh, you got to just really, really be thinking ahead. Um, here's a few shots of uh, Joe Haven. This is, uh, the, this is descendants of the Inuit that witnessed some of these Franklin men die. Um, this is an old bush pilot that came in uh, that knew information on Franklin. He was giving me stuff. And then this is an Inuit that I was kind of led to by the, by the council to work with. His name's Louis Kumakuk. And he actually turned out to be a bad guy. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And so anyway, I started looking. Um, I found some, I was flying along. I found, I found an anomaly. I went to check it out. It turned out to be a tomb. Don't know who or when, what period it was. But I mean, you'll just see this stuff in the middle of the tundra. So uh, this particular guy was probably shot in the back of the head. There's a bullet hole in the back of the head there. Maybe it was a murder. Maybe it was a mercy killing. I don't know. Happened a long time ago. And then, of course, I ran into my second problem with the plane as my whole alternator system went out. I lost all my electrical. So I decided at that point to call off the mission. That was the first time I've been really up that far. Not take any more chances. I had enough close calls. I had to fly home with no batteries basically try to get the landing gear up and down, recharge the battery. It was just a nightmare, but I finally made it all the way back. So two years ago, um, I went back up there again because in the interim, this Louis Kumakuk guy who I was telling all my ideas, sonar and I'm gonna, we're going to find the ships and yeah, we'll work together. Well, he went to the Canadian government and he told them all my ideas and really nobody cared about Franklin and what's going on with all that, all that. Uh, history until I showed up, I guess, because all of a sudden I started seeing on the news and the internet that Parks Canada, Prime Minister Harper's behind it, uh, can't, the Canadians want to find the Franklin, 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 all of a sudden. And what they did is they found a ship that, remember those ships that were searching for Franklin? I showed that slide of the 40 ships. That's one of the ships, the HMS Investigator. Everyone knew where the HMS investigator was. There was no, no secret. In fact, commercial pilots that I knew from 35,000 feet flying over the Arctic could sit down a clear day. They could look down and just see the little dot of the ship, and it's, you know, it's 15, 20 feet of water. So, but Parks Canada, you know, they went with the Zodiac boat. They went with the sonar. You know, all my ideas, they, they brought it in, and they, they played this whole thing like, hey, we found the HMS investigator, and we're going to find the Franklin ships. And that's also they could get funding and, and public support. So they brought in the heavy artillery, icebreakers, and, uh, you know, uh, and they found nothing. So 2011, I got a bigger airplane, a little more robust, better, handle, uh, better, better to handle loads. Uh, it's called, the, this is what you'll see in Alaska, the de Havilland Beaver. And uh, basically, it's on floats typically. I put it on Tundra tires. I outfitted the co cockpit with a computer and a thermal infrared system. Um, and I had, this, I had this theory that if these guys are frozen, remember those frozen graves I showed you before? If they're, if they're there, if, I don't know if you know about thermal cameras, but thermal cameras, can, you can look at something, see a heat or cold signature so sensitive it's less than 0.1 degree. I mean, you could, you could point it on anything. And even from 5,000 feet, you can see the slightest and my theory was that if, 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 if those guys are frozen in ice, and I'm looking for Franklin's tomb, let's say, that signature of the ground is going to be a little colder than the ground around it when the sun's hitting it. And it turned out that my theory was right. So I bought the thermal camera. I mounted it in the plane. I, I dug a hole in my backyard here in Hawthorne Woods, filled it with water, covered it, went up to 4,000 feet, and took pictures, and that's, that's actually uh, down by the, uh, you know, where we live here in Hawthorne Woods, you can see what it looks like from the air. And that simulated tomb, you can see a little cold blue spot. So it's like, wow, my theory works. Got a magnetometer system. I thought, well, if I'm going to find Sir John Franklin's tomb, 
you know, he's going to be wearing buttons and belt buckle or whatever, and you know, he can use a magnetometer to. But then I ran into a problem with the, the Canadian government because they're looking at this whole Franklin thing. I come to find out later about Arctic sovereignty. You know what sovereignty is? Sovereignty is like we own this. This is like America. We, we have sovereignty over the United States, Hawaii. Canada has sovereignty, and there's this big fight going on even right now on who has sovereignty of the Arctic. Russia, Canada, I mean, everyone recognizes Canada. Um, the Russians are coming up there planting flags underwater with submarines. We had a submarine incident while I was up there in 11. So I filled out all the applications. I'm like, I'm going to do it by the book. I got the public support behind me. I departed the same mission on Tundra Tires. Uh, I did a little side mission, um, and I found this trading post that I just really wanted to explore. So I landed my plane on this gravel ridge. I hiked to this trading post, and along the way, I was seeing these Arctic wolves, and they're huge. There was like, I saw about five or six of them, and I mean, these things are way bigger than common wolves. They have long, really long legs. They're gray white. In the winter, they're pure white. And uh, this is just some, some sh this is me, uh, this, is, this is, you know, no tent. I was telling you, no tent, I'm in the plane. So I went on the hike, I went on this mission, it was really cool. Um, I got to the trading post, I took some pictures. Uh, you know, this has been a banis, kind of like a, a time capsule from the 19, early 1900s. Even the butcher scale was still on the counter of the tr old tra the traders. You know, nothing's been touched. Checked out the cellar, no bodies. Went upstairs. Uh, even there was an old baby carriage outside. So I started a hike back. I followed my footsteps, about a six-mile hike, and I come to see all these footprints by my footprints. And they were, they were like this big. And I'm thinking, wow, there's no polar bears out. This is 200 miles away from the coast. And I started looking at the track really close. I'm like, wow, that's an Arctic wolf. And they're following me. And sure enough, they were. And, uh, and of course, halfway back, I ran into a snow squall, which means it lasts like 10 or 15 minutes. You know, the little snow squalls we get, but it's blinding. I couldn't see from here to that wall, and now I had my gun up because I'm just thinking, oh, these Arctic wolves are going to... So the whole... Finally got back to the plane, uh, took off, flew back. I actually had uh, gotten some hypothermia because I was all sweaty. I didn't have Under Armour underneath. And that's one thing, if you're doing hiking, make sure you have some type of, of, of insulated layer, but some way for the moisture to get out. Because I had a slight hypothermia. I was in the plane. I was starting to lose feeling in my fingers. I was getting very dizzy. Uh, I had to take a lot of rest. I was on the ground. I barely made it back to the plane and, and to focus to take off. Uh, luckily, I had all my clothes, because uh, I knew when I came back to the plane, no matter what, I was going to be like, I'm going to want dry clothes. So luckily, I had that laid out. So while I was flying, put on autopilot, I could, I could fly all the way, you know, get dry clothes on. So by the time I landed, I was back in good shape. Um, so no more waiting around. We're going right back to where we went before, uh, back all the way up to Cambridge Bay, but no sightseeing this time. Across the ocean, you know, this mission is about work, so we're going we're gonna to be looking for stuff. I still hadn't heard from the Canadian government, no word, and I thought that was c peculiar. Why aren't they... You know, they're just saying, we're waiting to hear from the Inuit. We're waiting to hear from the Inuit. And, and it's like, it's May, you know. How do you, how do you give people permission to an application, you know, two weeks before an expedition? It's like, it's ridiculous. Something's going on. So I literally just went to see the Inuit on my own. So I flew from Cambridge Bay to Joa Haven. Uh, I met with the Inuit. This is what it looks like there. I met with the elders. I met with the mayor. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we approve it. We didn't even know about this. We didn't even know about what you were planning to do. I'm like, oh, I find that interesting. So what was interesting, more interesting, is as soon as I told the Canadian government that I got approval from the Inuit, who they said we, they had to wait for, they sent me this letter within 18 hours saying, you are rejected. You're unqualified. They made up whatever excuse they could. So then I knew what was going on. So anyway, I'm like, okay, I'm here. I'll just be a tourist, and I'll still do the same thing I was going to do. I just won't bring my magnetometer with, but I'll still go look for tombs and cool stuff. So um, ran into a little problem. Another thing with uh, the, the, I don't know if it was sabotage. I don't know if it was by accident, but the fuel that I got had water in it. 
And the one thing that engines don't like is water. I mean, you put water in, a, in an engine, it stops. So if you're flying across that ice pack, ocean, and the engine stops, there's really nowhere to land. So I don't know what was up, but I was able to catch that in my pre-flight. So, um, and by the way, if you look at this picture, it looks like this beautiful glassy ice pack. That's at 5,000 feet. If you get down there, it's like those giant icebergs and ridges and hummocks and, and you, you, you just can't make a mistake. There's just nowhere to land. It's, it's not a landing, it's a crash landing. So anyway, here's, here's what it looks like up there. This is in um, Washington Bay, Erebus Bay. Um, polar bears. And then I came across something really interesting. Remember that place where those guys died about around where that was with the lifeboat, where they were sitting in the boat, the skeletons? I found something that really looked strange, so I was able to get low and take some pictures of it. And it looks like maybe parts of a sled or a boat, and I think these are remnants from that exact thing. Got back to, uh, to Cambridge Bay, landed, I blogged that picture of those little pieces, and immediately I got a threatening note from the Canadian government, basically said, you know, you better get the heck out of here, you're going to get fined $10,000, we're going to throw you in jail, so that's when I bugged out. So a couple of shots back, coming back across the ocean. Um, by the way, coming out of Canada, there's constant forest fires, I don't know if you know, but you got to really be careful flying and stay above the smoke and not flying the smoke. This is from 12,000 feet, just trying to climb over some of these smoke flumes. So what's next? So this guy, uh, Willie Lasserich, as it turns out, remember that guy that was that bush pilot that I met? It turns out that he's a really famous guy, and he had passed away, but he, he was known as the Flying Bandit. And uh, I got to be friends with his son, and his son actually helped me in 2011 do a lot of, well, does anybody know what this is? Exactly. And the reason I show you this picture is I had another theory. I said, let's, uh, you know, okay, I'm not going to look for Frank. Let's get back to these ships. But I had a theory. I'm like, you know, the Inuit, the testimony from the Inuit ancestors was that one of these ships sank in shallow water. In fact, for two or three years, the ship was sitting half out of the ice and they were pillaging it. And only when the masts got knocked down because of the ice pack, then the ship disappeared. And, but they knew about where, I was like, wow. Well, the, the water's so clear up there. I'd been up there. I could see the bottom at 50 feet. Maybe I can just fly coastlines with, a, with an HD camera, and maybe I could find the ship that way. This is actually a picture from the air of that HMS investigator that we were talking about before. You can kind of see it. Can anyone see that rough outline? Now, that's on, that's on a day when there's waves and the sun's not at the right ankle. Imagine if the water was glass and, 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 and still. You could see right down, and sure enough, so that was my plan, but this was what was really exciting is before I went up, I had um, a theory, and I, it just came to me in the middle of the night. I was thinking about, I, was, I don't know what I was thinking about, but I came up with this theory that, remember that picture? I mean, the key, the key pic thing about this picture and the test and all the, the historians is that boat was pointing back at the ships. In other words, it wasn't on the, they, they, these guys were trying to get back to the ships. Why were they trying to get back to the ships? My theory is that they were heading out, they were on this death march, and they had hiked 75 miles, but these guys were rushing back to get to the ships because the ice pack was breaking. Maybe it was, the warm, maybe it was a warm summer that year. So I thought, and basically what you see here is this, is, this is where they hiked, this is where most of them died. The ships were stuck up here. This is where they marched out. They were trying to get down here to this river. Most of them died here at a place called Starvation Cove. But these guys marched all the way back and they died here. And I thought to myself, why would 12 guys, because there, there was 10 other guys under that boat. They all ate each other, they were cannibalized. We know that because there's knife cuts on the bones, the historians. But why would they just, why would, you know, if they were dying as they went, why didn't they straggle along and die? Why did they all just stop there and die? And that's where my, I had this epiphany, this thought of, of if, you, if you really look at this map and think about it, this is the point when you can see where the ships are. You know, it's kind of like coming around a corner. You come to the shore, and the only reason you would stop 
is because you, this is what you'd see. You'd see the ships. That's how you left them. But as you came back, the ships were gone. Now, what does that mean? That means maybe one of the ships or both the ships, some of the guys made it back. My theory is they sailed on. So everyone in the world has been looking in this location for the ships. I believe the ships are somewhere else. And that formed my theory. So I'm like, I got the secret theory. I'm going to go back up there. I'm going to look for these ships. And that's what I did in 2012. I went back up there. I kept the floats on the plane because I had a different plan. Uh, what you see here in the back is auxiliary fuel system, survival gear, all kinds of, all my equipment. Um, this is flying up. By the way, that's the bulldog fly. I don't know if you've ever heard of a bulldog fly. Their horse fly is about this big. And they are attracted to dark colors. And if you try to hit them, then they swarm you. I mean, it's like really a nasty. Uh, I had to go through that while I was refueling in that place called Gillum. So anyway, this is all the way back up at Cambridge Bay. Um, here's a few pictures uh, up there. There's a famous shipper up called the, uh, the Maud, um, Roald Amundsen of Famix. He's the guy who first sailed the Northwest Passage. That's his ship, an old church. I took a few pictures before I started on my missions because the ice pack was still frozen. I still couldn't get access to the areas I wanted to search, so I took some pictures on the way. So what did I do next? Um, I went, my first theory was to check out a place called Denmark Bay. And um, I did a lot of searching up there. I thought that might be a place the ships might have uh, taken refuge. Um, and, and it was working. You can, you can see here, um, this is an image taken from the air of what it looks like. That's at about 3,000 feet. And you can see up north here, there's still a lot of ice up there. But what I was trying to do was look underwater to see if I saw any kind of anomaly, anything that looked different. Then I landed, and I thought I'd do, I thought I'd do some searching, because I thought if the, ships, if the ships were there for a period of time, or they, they were sunk there, that certainly on shore there would be some remnants of them coming ashore. The mosquitoes up there, I don't know what the mosquitoes live on. There's millions of billions and billions of mosquitoes. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. They just landed at the search area here. This uh, very desolate place. And I am just surrounded by mosquitoes. I can't even open the plane door. It's going to be fun camping in the plane. Once I open the doors, about a thousand mosquitoes go in with me. Um, I'm just going to get my pack and uh, do some hiking. There's a shoreline right over there. I'm on the north side of the bay in the lake of the ocean. <clears throat> well, I covered about 12 miles, and I'm halfway back. No sign of anything. Just a lot of animal tracks. Caribou, wolf, nothing spectacular, no polar bear. So anyway, it was mosquito. I was like, okay, got, I got done with my hike. I'm like, out of here. Let's get on to the next mission. So the next mission basically was uh, a place way to the north called Hadley Bay. Um, this is about as far north as I've ever been in my life uh, on any of these missions. That's the thing. Uh, you don't want to shoot it behind the polar bear, because then the polar bear will come towards you. So I've got I'll get two cracker shells and uh, maybe a couple slugs. We got just straight steel, three inch loads for close range. I hope I don't have to see that. These bears are about 700 to 1,000 pounds. All right, let's start with the cracker shell.
And we'll start also with another cracker shell after these two, and we'll follow with those two slugs. All right, safety off. Let's see, uh, we'll gauge it. I'm gonna shoot to the right of that, that little bend in the river, a little uh, mound. Let's see how far out it goes. Didn't go anywhere. Blew up right here. Okay, well, it's better than behind the barrel. Let's try another one. Ooh, there it goes. Oh, wow. That was pretty far. I don't know if, uh, so I guess I would shoot it if uh, the bear is on the other side of the river, not here, but that other part of the river there. All right, let's blast away at the water here, just on the other edge. All right, well that works. So you just see a lot of skulls, by the way, when you're walking. Uh, fish, this is why I was talking about bringing your fishing gear up there, you could never go hungry. Uh, just get arched, arctic char. A um, few wildlife shots. Caribou, the caribou can't come right up to you. They're not as afraid. This is kind of a cool little video I took of, uh, I call him Fox the Biter. I put my camera by the hole. He knocked the camera in the hole. <laughs> so you can, you can do it with these GoPro cameras, you can do all kinds of stuff like that. You just put them and then leave for like two hours, come back. And, uh... <laughs> so anyway. So a lot more searching, a lot more. Uh, here, here's a, a shot of what it looks like flying over the ice pack low altitude. I'm about, um, that's my, my, I've got a camera on the back of the, the wing, on the, the horizontal stabilizer back there, so from within the cockpit I can control that. So I give you a feel of, uh, this is actually where the ice never melts. This is the multi-year ice, and the reason it's melted right in this part is because it's near a river mouth where the water's moving. And, uh, you know, here's some more shots. I'll skip ahead. So, my first real mission, um, looking at where the ships are commonly thought to be, I went down to a place called O'Reilly Island, which you see here. I did some aerial searching, got some really intriguing shots. Look how deep you could see. That's like 40 feet deep. You could see underwater. I started to head north to look for plausible ship location, too, based on my theories. Um, started to take more aerial shots there. And I started to pick up some, some targets. Um, don't know what they are, but just, uh, just interesting, you know, things to come back later and research. Could be small, you know, it could be anything. Uh, and then up to a place, actually I flew a place called the, in, in it would call the bad place. Up to this place, uh, just to the north there, which is where that, that boat where those men died, this is kind of on the trail where these men were marching. This is a place where right in here there was a camp that the Inuit found, a tent where there were all these skeletons inside and there was a pot in the middle like stew and there were like human bones in there. So they were just eating each other until they died. So the Inuit we called it the bad place. And then up uh, at Erebus Bay, uh, this is what I found uh, last summer washed up in the ice pack, some really cool stuff. Maybe parts of the ships. This could be part of one of the ship's masts. And what I did is I ended up landing. I found a lake that I could land in. Thank God I was on floats. So I went back, I prepared. This is flying back in the morning. I was able to actually land on this, on King William Island, which is always my dream, is to actually land the plane on King William Island. So I'll just give a brief uh, feel for that. All right, it's 45 degrees, slight breeze, and uh, just landed here on this small lake. We 
which is about two miles from uh, the area that I want to search. And there's muskox miles long, um, eight oh, feet this deep. This is a dangerous situation. Um, the mud flats. Now, the this is at the shore of where I was doing my searching. I was actually hiking there, and it's like mushy mud because the tide, every 12, uh, 12 hours, the tide is, is coming up and down, and you've got to be really careful. Like in Alaska, a woman, uh, I forgot what her name was, died because they were on ATVs, got stuck in Cook's Inlet. Cook's Inlet is a famous place for this. And she got out of her ATV, and her, her, she sunk up in the mush, in the muck up to here, and she couldn't get out. And now the tide was coming up. And I think they ended up, uh, you know, they tried to save her, and it's you know, her husband, and they're all trying to pull her out, and the tide's coming up. And they took the shotgun apart, and she was breathing through the shotgun, and gone, you know. Uh, so it, it almost happened to me because I, I, my plan was, oh, what if, what if, what if, if I had hip waders on, um, I did get stuck. And what's weird is, you would never know this, I would never know this, but when you're hiking along and you get in a situation of, not panic, but like you're, you're running into something you shouldn't be, your human instinct is to push forward faster. So the way you get in trouble, like quicksand and all that stuff, is when you're walking along and it starts getting mushy or bad, you, you try to run through it, you don't back off. That's your, your human instinct. I don't, I don't know any studies, but I know that's, that's what happened to me, and I ended up getting in the thick of it, in this mud flat, but what I did at my backup plan was to unbuckle my hip waders, slip out of those, and roll out. And that's what I did, because one of my legs I couldn't get out. Um, these are what, call, what are called tent rings. These are from old. Some of these are from 1700s, 1800s. You could tell by the way the stones are buried. And then I found this is the location where those men died. This is the actual location. This is the actual spot where the Franklin men died right at this spot here on this peninsula. There was a lifeboat, uh, whaleboat found here with up to 12 men that died here, skeletons. Here's a marker. This is the actual location where it happened. And if you look close, looks like there's a metal trunk in there, I'm sure that contains it's a makeshift coffin. Uh, they did autopsies on these men. Uh, bodies were strewn all over. Skeletons. Then I, then I was able to, to go down and research some of the stuff I saw from the air as kind of documenting and that's that long, what might be, people believe this might be one of the ship's masts from uh, one of the ships that washed up. So on the way out, it's like, wow, I got this great information. I got to go back and research this. But on my way out, I'm going to now fly over the area where I think the ships would have sailed to. So here are shoreline pictures of, uh, of that. So I got a lot of good imaging. I flew all the way back, back to Chicago. This is Hudson Bay on the way back. And um, three weeks later, all of a sudden, well, I should tell you why I flew out. One of the reasons I flew out, too, was I was, I was finished with what I was doing, but I kind of rushed out because the CBC was coming looking for me. CBC is like NBC, but it's in Canada. And intermediaries in Inuit, they're coming with the CBC cars. They go, they want to see you. They want to interview you. And I didn't want that because I was already threatened with a fine. I was already, you know, I had, so I had to get out of there before. Three weeks later, Prime Minister Harper, who's on a personal mission uh, on all of this, flew in with his entourage unannounced and said, we are going to find these ships. So obviously the word, word got out that, and, and mainly my, my planes parked at the airport, this gravel strip where all these C-130s come in and cargo planes and they see the yellow beaver. So... The word got to the government, so they, you know, they, they swooped in. And uh, I started looking at my website. This is my website tracker, and I could see they were just hitting the heck out of my website. So they were trying to figure out where the stuff was that I found. And that's Prime Minister Harper. Remember that blue boat, that picture of the kids fishing? They pulled the tape off, and it's the Martin Bergman research ship. It was all, like, undercover. So this is their research team. They're trying to find the ships. And there's that guy that Doug Stenton guy who sent me the threatening letter, because he wants to find this stuff in the government. Uh, and where did they go? 
They read my blog, and then they went, where did they carry out their searching? They carried out their searching in, in the same place that I did. So they're basically copying everything I do. And here's a picture they took and put on the CBC that they found. And that's, remember the log I showed you that I found? But they found it. Here's my picture, here's their picture. So obviously they're just trying to figure out what I'm doing. So here's the coolest part of all. I come back to Chicago and I go through thousands of images. These images are from a camera that's 24.5 megapixel Nikon with special polarized lens and it's a full frame camera. So you can basically really zoom in on stuff. And I started analyzing all the pictures I'm going through and I'm coming along and I'm looking and all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, what was that? And so I kind of go backwards and I could come to this picture and I go, hey, what's that over there? So I zoom in on that and I'm like, hey, that looks like, that looks like a ship. That looks like, like the outline of a ship. So we did some, uh, some analysis, some, some enhancements to the picture and, and this could actually be one of the ships. So. Uh, that's where I'm at right now. Basically, uh, my plan is to go back. 2000, I don't know. Everyone thinks I'm going back this summer up there. Actually, the Canadians are now, I heard through my contacts, are waiting for me, the government, the police. They think I'm going to come back, but I'm not. I've got no rush. Those ships have been there 160-some years. They can wait another five or ten years. I don't care. But my plan is to go back, not with scuba stuff, but take the GoPro camera, put it on a pole, drift over that target, because I, I have the shoreline with that target. I know exactly on the map where this is. Lower that camera down and drift right over it and get footage of if that's the ship. But I gotta try and do that secretly. That's a challenge. I gotta, I gotta, go, I gotta pick a year, wait a couple of years maybe, sneak up there um, and, uh, and get that done. So that's kind of the, the conclusion. And uh, if, if anybody has any questions, uh, yes. Be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Ron? Any questions? I saw you yawning. Um, no, I'm just kidding. The boat where um, those <laughs> Frankie saw. where um, that one guy had his body still intact, but another skeleton across from the boat. Do you think that um, some of those people? like one or two of those people could have gotten to the ships and taking them instead? I think that's absolutely possible. You're talking about where the, two, the 12 men died. It's called Boat Place. Um, I think that, that it's probably not likely because the, uh, I mean, the, you would probably find a, more of a trail out, out to those boats. They wouldn't have gone across the ice. They probably would have went up the shore but it's absolutely possible. I mean, there, you know, it could have been, there could have been 14 guys there. But what my, what my theory is is that when they got there, the reason they stopped there is because the boats were gone. Because it's like, like put, put your, because this is how I do it. And as you live your life when you're dealing with situations, put your hat on of the other person. How are they thinking? And I'm thinking if they came up, they came in and the ships are gone, then, then why go anywhere? It's like you're, you're just destitute to, I'm going to die here and it would probably be despair and sorrow. So I believe they probably all just, there was no ships. Because if the ships were there, those guys came so many miles, they wouldn't, 12 wouldn't have died there. They, at least, I mean, wouldn't you, like if you're at the finish line of the marathon and you're just ready to die, but there's the goal, you're gonna, you're gonna crawl there. So it was the fact that there were 12 men there together, just doesn't make sense that it would, it would end that way in that spot for any other reason. But it's possible. Any other questions? Over here. When you landed in the place where there were a bunch of plane wrecks, how did you feel because you were also in a plane? The plane wreck, like when I went inside that plane, that big plane that crashed, and the question was, how did I feel? Yeah, well, um, that plane crash, uh, it, it gave me a chill, a real chill, because you, you, when you're standing in that plane crash and you know that people died there, and you, you're literally standing, I was standing in the cockpit of the ruins, 
you just, you know, it just gives you a lot of pause, and you just basically you just sat, stood there silently and, and just went, wow, you know. I just got, I got this feeling inside, like, and, and it also gives you a lot more caution, you know, when you're flying. I'm a big what-if guy, and, and I'll give you an example. You know, when I, the reason I was able to do that landing, not a scratch on the plane, I had like eight seconds, you got to think like this, is because I didn't just practice. Like, like if you go to all these little planes you see flying around, part of getting a pilot's license is you have to do what's called an engine out landing. But they don't turn the engine off, they idle it. So in case you get in trouble, you can just throttle it back on, you know, and you see planes coming in practicing. Well, I didn't do that because it's a big difference. The plane's a lot slower and you have to put the nose down when the engine's really off because the prop is frozen and it slows the plane down. So I would go in the morning on lakes up north before there were boats, and I was confident in my abilities by myself, and I would shut the engine off. And I did actual no engine landings. And you can do that on big lakes, you know, because you don't want to do that on runways, because you could go, you know, on a lake, you know, it's an endless runway, and you can't really goof up. But it was chilling to stand in there. We have another question here. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you ever encounter a shark? No, I did not encounter a shark up there. There's no sharks, but I encountered a humpback whale that almost flipped my uh, zodiac boat, and that's scary. Like the the the, uh, the beluga whales, they're friendly, and they and not to say that bowhead whales aren't friendly, but they're so big and they're dumb, and uh, they they came. I mean, this big massive piece of skin came by me. I was like, whoa, that was scary. That was the closest thing to a shark. I hate sharks, by the way. I'm scared to death of sharks. Why did you go alone? That's a very good question. Why did I go alone? Well, part of it is uh, it's kind of like a spiritual, uh, fulfilling, you know, inner, you know, sp get space, reflect. But the biggest reason is, is that um, I can't babysit people and people. I remember that bear encounter I was telling you about in Alaska with the brown bear? The reason I got in that predicament was because of another guy that was with me who put me in that position. And I've been in um, these kind of, not expeditions, but other outdoor experiences with other people. And what happens is when you're with someone else doing something like this, you compromise because of them. Um, not in a bad way, but they, you, know, you, you start to question. Let's say I, I'm, you know, I, I say, we should get out of here. And they're like, hey, let's stay five more minutes. Well, you're influenced. And then you have indecision. And then you're, 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 it creates a dangerous situation. On that iceberg, remember when, I, when the polar bear swam? If I would have stayed five more minutes there, and not like my, when I had my gut instinct, made the decision, get out, if I would have waited five or 10 more minutes, I would have been in a life-threatening uh, situation. So I don't like to um, go with other people because um, I kind of say it's like I don't like to babysit. I, I don't like to babysitter. I don't like to have influence. I like to just control my own destiny. And if I'm getting into a dangerous situation, that's that's my deal. I don't want to put someone else's life at risk. How do you stay calm in life-threatening situations? Well. I don't know. I think, think um, maybe it's the way I'm wired. Um, I always, you know, you always wonder how you'll react, and until you get in that situation, you won't know. Um, but you just have to really stay calm. But it happens so fast. It's just the way you're wired. You just, your mind, my mind just, when I'm in a situation, I have extra focus, and I just, I just don't think about other things. I just deal with the problem at hand. And, um, you know, it, hasn't, it doesn't happen every day or every week in my life, but the three or four times I've been able to, to do that, so I'm lucky maybe that I'm able to do that. But I, it's not something I train for or try to do. Did you have any situations where you couldn't get back to your plane so you had to like stay on shore for a while or on land? Um, let me think. No, I think it was just that situation where the plane almost floated away. I've never, I've never been... Um, never gotten myself in that situation. That's like your island, that's your lifeline. I mean, all, you know, uh, when it was parked on King William Island, it, it looked really calm, right? No problem, parked by the rocks. But I made sure to tie the heck out of that plane because I don't like to ever leave the plane more than two hours, period. 
And sure enough, I came back to that plane. Oh, I didn't have that video. And the wind was ripping, and the weather changed. The wind and 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 uh, it could. If I didn't take the extra time to secure it, it would have just it would have been lost. Yep. You can just hand the mic. Oh, I'm um, sorry. When you, by the people where the 12 men died, do you think the boat would have sunken instead of sh um, shipped away? Say again? I could the boat could have sunken instead of, like, sunken? Oh, could the boats have sunk? The ships that I was looking for? Absolutely. In fact, I, I, I'm sure that both of them are sunk. But the question is, where did they sink? Um, that's the big question. How about uh, this, this guy over here has had his hand up? Front and center. You can hand the mic up. Would you make money if you found ships? Um, if I wanted to, I probably could make a lot of money, but that's not my goal. Um, I had pledged to the Inuit that um, the, the backstory on that is when I work with the Inuit, it's a lot of spiritual work I do with them, with the Lakota Indians on Pine Ridge. and, and and my goal was if I find any relics that I would tell them first. And um, interesting story is on King William Island where their village is 75 miles away is where that boat place was. The Canadian government set, um, I think, $200,000 to build a, a national park. And then basically the pledge was if I could find where Franklin's tomb was, that's where they would put the national park. So it's all about the Inuit and, and creating tourism for them. I want to help them. So no. How long does it take to prepare for each expedition? Well, the first expedition, uh, it took probably six months of, of heavy preparation. Uh, and then the time frame got smaller and smaller. As uh, like the last mission, it only took a month and a half. Because like the fuel systems, the back, I mean, had all that stuff dialed in. So it didn't take too long at all. How are you able to like get like those like threat letters if you're like always on the move and so the letters yeah, which letters like, how are you able to get the letters from like the Canadian government when you're like always like moving? Oh, uh, you mean like that the Franklin men wrote? Yeah. Oh, or the the threatening letters? Like the ah, the threatening letters. Well, there is a big satellite dish up there at Cambridge Bay that I had access to, so I could get to the internet and to my email. Um, However, they all, the Inuit, use that dish or that service. So the only time I could really use it was between the hours of like midnight and 3 a.m. And by the way, at those hours, midnight and 3 a.m. is when the kids play. Five, and I'm talking five-year-olds. That's when they're, they're in the playground. So it's, the, but the, 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 the bandwidth is so limited. But that's how I was able to. Why does the Canadian government hate you so much? <laughs> Well, the Canadian government, I don't know that they hate me, but they, they, they really don't want me to find these ships because, and I think it's really the president, Prime Minister Harper feels that, uh, that those ships represent, there's a tenuous tie into to, to English history and, and, and Canada is based on English history. And I think it, they feel it would be an embarrassment if an American or someone else, actually it's not even the American thing, I think it's, Anyone other than the government finds these ships uh, would be an embarrassment to the government. He takes it personally. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the hardest part of all of the expeditions? Like, what was the hardest part for you? The hardest part? The hardest part, no doubt, and you'll probably laugh, but it was securing the airplane and preparing the airplane for every mission because of the wind and the rain and the cold and the bugs and the gravel dust and C-130s coming in trying to protect and just being paranoid that my plane's going to blow over or get destroyed and the stress of sleeping, uh, trying to get some sleep when it's always daylight. Thinking about the plane, I have not, you know, I still have dreams, it's funny, I still, I, we laugh, I still have dreams at night where the plane is destroyed in this way, it's just this, it's always on your mind, is protecting the plane. Because without that you have nothing. And they're very fragile. Airplanes are not like tanks. I mean, when you, when you, you know, they're built of aluminum, thin aluminum. They're light so they can fly. They're not like battleships. So, uh, you know, a big breeze can blow it right over. How long do you usually stay on an expedition? Uh, usually 30, uh, 90 days. 
yeah, uh, 60 days. I shouldn't say 90 days. That was my longest one. I would say average 45 to 60 days, a couple of months, month and a half. And, and, and that's the only window you have. I have to time it, uh, fly up there, starting, you know, get ready in, um, in, in April, May, get up there by June. The ice doesn't melt until early July, and then in uh, end of August, it's going down the tubes, the weather. So you just have this window. Um, okay, so in class we're reading Life of Pi, and he survives by having a lot of luck. So how much luck right. do you think is involved in exploring and surviving in extreme conditions? Oh, that's a great question. I think there's always some luck involved, um, but I, th I think it's, it's, it's um, I think a lot of it has to do with risk management. You know what risk management is? It's, it's managing the risk, like wh how far, like if that's the line of where real risk is, you know, I'm kind of the guy that's like, like here, but I kind of always know my gut when to back off. And, and the biggest risk when you're up there is weather. And, and when to take off and land, because you can get trapped in the air with fog and all kinds of, that's where people get in big trouble flying. But risk, um, I, I've never really had any, uh, I've had close calls, but I've been able to get out of those situations because I've always thought ahead of my backup plans. The what if, what if, if this happens, what if that, I don't think about it then, I'm already prepared for it. So uh, man, risk management. With the uh, wolves, did you have like ever have any like close encounters with the wolves? Yes, I did. Not super close encounters, but uh, I was on um, uh, one of those hikes on the shoreline, and I had gone out on the ice with my fishing pole, you know, and I was looking back at the shore, and it looked like some boulders, and um, you know, and I looked back, and the boulders had moved. I was probably half a mile away, you know, it's big rock, but they, they were wolves. And every time I looked, they would stop. It's kind of like that game, you know, where that red light, whatever game we play, and you look, yeah, and that's what the wolves were doing with me. And there were six of them, and so I was like, so I, I made sure I didn't run. I got back to shore, and, you know, I was trying to get back to the plane. I had my, I had my shotgun with me. I was okay. But it was the same game as I started jogging down the shore to my plane, and then I turn around and they stop. And then I, run, I go a little more, I look, and they stop, but they're closer. So they're getting closer and closer. I didn't have to shoot them because I got back to the plane. Um, do you generally bring your own food, or do you catch it and prepare it yourself? Um, I do both of those, and also there's food at, uh, at Cambridge Bay that I can buy or, or eat. But I'm, I'm on the, uh, I would say the more, majority of it I bring. It's not like I sit and fish every day and, and fillet fish and eat fish. Most of it's stuff I bring. But, you know, that's more the, the if you get in a situation, you know the fish is there. What made you want to do, like, the expeditions? What made me want to do it? Um, I, th I think it's that I'm an adventurer. I think sometimes I was born 100 or 200 years too late. I, I'm, like, I'm like, like the Lewis and Clark. There's just something inside me that wants to discover. It's a discovery thing. I, I, it's everything I do in my life. I love learning and discovery, and that's why, uh, you know, I do this. It's, it's, and, and the big thing about this particular mission is the stuff's still there because it's really hard to get there, and I had a way to do it. I figure out a logistical way to pull it off. That's what makes it really intriguing and not just, you know, people looking for Spanish gold for money. That doesn't interest me and there's all these boats running into each other and getting in fights. I mean, this, this is go up there. It's an adventure. It's wildlife. It's spiritual. Um, it's, 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 it's exciting because it's spontaneity. I mean, that's the whole fun of life is, is what's tomorrow and, and discovery. So that's what drives me. All right. We have one more question. Okay. Um, how did you find the water and your gasoline? Well, what you do, every pilot even uh, here, uh, you always do a fuel check. And all the fuel tanks have these little, um, the bottom, it's called a sump. So before you ever take off in a plane anywhere, every pilot does a fuel check. And you take like a glass bottle and you, you stick that up there. And, the, and water always sinks to the lowest point in fuel. And they color the fuel blue, so you can see the clear water versus the blue. So the design is, if your plane's out in the rain for three days, maybe some water leaks in the, in the tank, you can just drain it right out with the sump. 
So you always do that as a pre-flight check. You, uh, you make sure that there's no water. Well, I was doing the pre-flight check. You know, you'll, you'll get a few drops a little bit. Well, this was gallons of water, so something was afoot there. But that was, that's why you do your pre-flight pre checks. Um, but hey, I want to thank you all for coming today. I mean, I just want to leave you. I, ho I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, that's really uh, what I share with you. Thank you. What I share with you is part of me. I mean, that's that's the adventure in me. I just want to say to you, you know, you're all like I was in eighth grade. I remember what it was like, and um, you got to think of like history. History is adventure. I mean. I really didn't take advantage like I could have in school. I was kind of a daydreamer. And, and when you're going to class and all the subjects, uh, in history, it's, it's really stories. They're great stories of the past. And, and as you, you know, you guys are going to be going to high school. Um, I'll just say, I'll just leave you with this. The way I live, live is, I mean, live, live in the moment, make bold decisions. Don't take crazy risks, but, but take risks with your life. Don't live in a box that other people I mean, I, I never lived in a box that people said I should do this. I mean, you, you, you follow the road, but follow your own road. Uh, take bold risks and, and, and uh, you know, follow your road. So that's it. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wait, one more fun thing. Um, we, uh, I brought th three survival packs that you see on the table. And I brought a, and we're going to give this away. We're going to do a little, little pull a name out of the hat. All your names are here, I guess. And then I've also got um, uh, what's called an ELT. Now, the ELT is uh, really, it's not like anyone who would use this. Ever. <laughs> you guys would probably laugh. But I'm going to give one away, and maybe someday you'll use it. But if you, if you register it with NOAA, and you, put, and you ever get in trouble wherever you're at in the world, you hit two buttons, a helicopter will come. A helicopter will come pick you up. So if any of you, you know, big campers or whatever. If you're in, if you're in history class and you want to get out, you just hit the two buttons. <laughs> yeah. Or you can take the rest of the day off school. Okay. For the first survival pack, Joshua Zimmerman. Where is he? Is he over here? Okay, we won't make you come down and make a speech. All right. Who's it going to be? It's going to be Lauren Green. All right. All right, one more for the survival pack. Alex Pagini? Did I get that right? All right, drum roll. No, 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 no. This is for the big one. I'm, I, I picked out a, a hard piece of cardboard here. So if you wrote your name on like, like cardstock, then you're in the game. Oh, it's a big one. Alex Kurowski? Krasowski. Krasowski. Yeah. You win the grand prize, man. I hope you're a camper. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everybody.